Thank you so much for inviting me and thank you for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Can you hear me okay at the back? Wonderful. So as Steve has said, I'm currently writing a book about one of the most long-lived and popular books about health ever written in English. The book is called Aristotle's Masterpiece, and I'll say right now, it's not by Aristotle. More on that in a moment. And it's not usually considered a masterpiece either. Um, the book was first published in London in 1684. Let me see if I click this, if that's going to... Um, here's the title page of the first edition. And, you know, title pages from this period are very chatty because they don't have dust jackets. They don't have book covers. And this tells us what's in the book. It's basically a midwifery advice book. It talks about how conception happens, pregnancy, labor delivery, the care of a newborn. It's basically a pretty typical midwifery book from the latter half of the 17th century, but there are two special features, and they come right at the end of that list. Um, you'll see it says that it talks about advice to both sexes in the act of copulation. So it's going to talk about sex. Most midwifery books don't talk about that. And it says it's got some monstrous births drawn from life. So it has pictures of very deformed infants. Again, not particularly typical of the form. We don't know who actually wrote this book, and they didn't actually write it. They compiled it out of bits of other books. The first is a massive tome of natural philosophy by Levinus Lemnius called The Secret Miracles of Nature. Um, first published in English in 1658, but it dates from a century earlier. I think the person who compiled the masterpiece didn't use this great big tome. He or she used this a little book called A Discourse on Generation. Some hack writer looked at this huge book on natural philosophy and basically picked out all the naughty bits, <laughs> everything on sex, and published it as this nice, handy, cheap little volume called A Discourse on Generation. All the, lem all the lemnius in the masterpiece comes from this little book, as far as I can tell. So that, plus Jacob Reef's Expert Midwife, first published in Switzerland, well, in German and in Latin, um, about a century before. First English edition is English 1637. It's then cheerfully plagiarized by many other midwifery texts. So those make the masterpiece. And we don't know who did that compiling. I think the book is called Aristotle's Masterpiece for a couple of reasons. First of all, Aristotle is the classical authority on generation, on reproduction. But also, Aristotle is known in 17th century popular culture as a kind of sex expert, which isn't how we think of him today. Um, there's a different pseudo-Aristotle text published in the late 16th century that has a series of question and, question and answers about reproduction. Almost immediately after that book is published, I start to see references in London plays that say things like, well, I know enough Aristotle to know you're pregnant. <laughs> Um, and there's this whole plethora of these references to Aristotle as the guy who knows about sex. So I think that's why they put Aristotle's name in the title of this. And unlike other 17th century midwifery books, the masterpiece was a howling success that went into hundreds of editions over the next two and a half centuries. By the middle of the 18th century, there are more editions of the masterpiece than all other popular books on reproduction combined. It spawns multiple versions. There's four, three or four different versions of the masterpiece. And there are these other pseudo-Aristotle texts, um, the problems, the midwife, and the legacy. And then later in the 18th century, the masterpiece, the problems, the midwife, and the legacy all get combined and get sold, all four books together in one cover, with the delightfully misleading title of Aristotle's Works. It's basically four books about sex. <laughs> but I've seen lots of like New England editions from the early 19th century, and they all look so charming. They all just say, Aristotle's works on the spine. You could have them in any parlor, no problem. The book was still being published into the 1930s, largely unaltered. I recently found a reference that suggested it was for sale in London in the mid-1950s, and it's not as an antiquarian book. Copies of it are piled high next to copies of Mary Stopes' Married Love, the book that I think ultimately put the masterpiece out of competition. 
And then I was speaking with someone in York a couple weeks ago, and he told me a wonderful story that a publisher in Wakefield had a bunch of the masterpieces on his hands in the 1950s, and he hired, had some assistant read the weekly local paper and particularly read the weddings column, and he would send an advertisement in plain brown envelope to the newly married, suggesting they might like to purchase this book. I don't even know how to wrap my head around the thought that texts that were originally written in the middle of the 16th century are somehow still being retailed as good knowledge in the 1950s. So there's, as you can see, many different versions and editions, but the bottom line is there's basically, on average, an edition of the Masterpiece every year for 250 years. That's pretty good going. <laughs> so if your great-grandmother or your great-great-great-great-great-grandmother lived in the Anglo-American world and had a book on sex and babies tucked up in her sock drawer, very likely this was the book. When the noted Shakespeare scholar A.L. Rouse went up to Oxford in the early 1920s, he never mentioned to his mother that he was studying Aristotle. He said in his memoirs, Aristotle would have meant to my mother, as secretly to Victorian women, his book on childbearing, unmentionable. But I knew that that book was secreted in her chest of drawers in the old home. The book that Mrs. Rouse kept tucked away in her chest of drawers had been st selling steadily since 1684 in largely unchanged textual form since 1702. So for me, as a historian, the book is really interesting, first because of its sheer ubiquity and its incredible long life, in part because it is so ubiquitous it pops up in the historical record like no other book of its type. This evening I'll share with you just a few of the stories I have collected about actual people reading this book. Because reading is a largely silent activity, it often doesn't get recorded very well. It's hard to find out about reading. And if, like me, you're interested in ordinary people, not wealthy people that amassed libraries and then left them to someone in their will and left a written record of all the books they owned, if you're just an ordinary person, it's even harder to find out about reading in the past. And, of course, the book is about sexuality. Sexuality and sex are also things that often don't get written down very much. So, interesting book. So part of my project is to understand how a book like this continues to appeal to readers when everything else around it changes. Theories of reproduction, gender roles, ideas about male and female sexuality, infant care practices, childbirth, all these change dramatically from 1684 into the 1930s, and yet the book just goes right on selling. As a historian, I want to understand how and why that is. Now, I think you can tell from my enthusiasm about the topic, I could talk all day about the book and why it intrigues me, but this evening I'm just going to give you a taste of two themes. The first is about how the book was read and used, and the second is about the actual contents of the book itself. So let me start with the reading practices. One of the reasons I began working on this book was the stories that I came across about readers interacting with the text, which again, I just have to say is very, very unusual for a popular medical book. You know, people just didn't write letters saying, Dear Mom, read Nicholas Culpepper today, and wow, my ideas about the womb are completely different. <laughs> you know, we might wish that, but we just don't, that doesn't happen. So I found stories like this one about one John Cannon. Cannon was born in Somerset in 1684, the same year the book was first published. He grew up in an agrarian community until at the age of 23, he took up a job as an excise officer, traveling from place to place, setting and checking on taxes. Very unusually, he wrote his memoirs in later life, and they're still in the Somerset Record Office. Um, this is a very rich and peculiar account of many aspects of provincial culture. He actually talks about, for example, being taught how to masturbate. Who knew? Um, he was going swimming with a bunch of lads, and this was what was demonstrated. Um, he talks about healing practices that are, we would consider magical, a whole range of stuff. Um, as a teenage agricultural laborer, he borrowed books from friends, and he seems to have been quite an active reader. So once, at one moment, he purloins his mother's copy of Aristotle's masterpiece and another midwifery book, noting in his memoirs that he stole them from her because he wanted to know what women looked like underneath their clothing. When his enraged mother took the books back, 
He spied on the family's maidservant when she went to the privy. And bless his heart, wrote it down. Or there's the uproar in Northampton, Massachusetts in the 1740s when Jonathan Edwards, who later became the well-known divine and president of what was then Princeton College, but in the 1740s in Northampton, he was just beginning his career. He's a, very, he's a newly fledged minister. So he found that adolescent boys in his parish had been reading the book and teasing the girls with it. He interrogated the lads, and his questions and answers still survive. We still have the piece of paper where he has the questions and what the boys said. Um, it wasn't a really smart career move for Edwards because he went into the pulpit and denounced the boys who turned out to be the sons of leading parishioners. Not a smart move. But for me, this is a gold mine. I know who hid the book under their mattress for a few months. I know which other midwifery book a woman had tucked up next to the chimney in her house. I know what the lads actually said to the girls to tease them about sex. Very unusual. Or there's the English radical tailor, Francis Place, who tells us in his memoirs he read the masterpiece while a schoolboy in the 1780s. He wrote, this I contrived to borrow and compared parts of it with the accounts of the miraculous conception in Matthew and Luke. And the result was that in spite of every effort I could make, I could not believe the story. So basically, he reads the masterpiece and decides the biblical account of Jesus' conception can't possibly be true, that there's just no way that's the case. And I find this especially ironic because the masterpiece actually starts one of the versions actually starts by talking about God's creation and sort of situating the book within this sort of, I won't say divine wisdom exactly, but the notion that this is a God-made universe and that they're going to talk within that frame. It has quotes from the Bible, etc. But Place read it completely contrary to what the alleged purpose of the text was. Or there's the moment in a cheesy American novel from the 1840s when a character goes into a bookstore and buys the masterpiece. This novel, it's called The Green Family, is typical of sensational pot boilers produced in the 1840s and 1850s. Characters are poisoned, kidnapped, murdered, abandoned, seduced on every page. <laughs> um, very zippy reading. Needless to say, novels like these were not keepers. They were not owned by respectable libraries. And only two copies of the book survive today. I was fortunate to read one of those copies in a library in Massachusetts this past summer. The novel is set in Hartford, Connecticut, and it claims to be a thinly veiled expose of the evil doings in town. Now, at least one reader bought this idea because this reader treated this as a Roman clay and wrote in pencil the names of who he thought the real people were over the characters. So if I knew a lot about 19th century Hartford, wow, this would be great stuff. But he actually bought this premise. Here's the moment when our hero, James Green, goes and buys Aristotle. There was indeed a bookstore in Hartford in that period called Cook's. So him and a buddy, they share a room in a rooming house and the buddy says, oh, you, you need to see some books. You don't know nothing. Let me take you down to Cook's. So they go down to Cook's. He buys this um, masterpiece of the great Grecian philosopher Aristotle and has quite startling information in there. Um, and it turns out there was a Cook's bookstore in Hartford, Connecticut in this period. Interestingly, it's not Peter Cook, it's Oliver Cook. And from what we know, Oliver Cook sold a lot of religious and devotional works. Um, so maybe the author is poking fun at a staid local businessman. But this reader, I don't think you can hardly see it. I put a blue arrow next to it. The reader who thinks that they know who the real people are says it's actually supposed to be the Cook. So now we have three different Cook's bookshops potentially running around, and I'm not sure exactly how to parse it. There is a Peter Cook who's a bookseller in this period, but he's in Albany, New York. The book is actually produced in Springfield, Massachusetts, not very far away. So maybe he's purposely conflating them. I don't know. Um, or maybe the staid religious bookseller, Oliver Cook, had a nice sideline in the back room, and if you knew enough to ask for it, he would sell you Aristotle's masterpiece. I don't think we'll ever know. Now, the more astute among you have already noticed that in my stories of actual readers, the readers so far have all been male. Unmarried, adolescent males at that. Not the usual target for midwifery books. When I first realized that I was piling up juicy stories of male readers of the masterpiece, 
I got a little discouraged because I had initially started working on this kind of book because I wanted to find a way into women's knowledge about their own bodies, however mediated, distanced, and imperfect that might be. So I was a little startled to keep finding these men. I realized that at least two factors help explain why I kept finding male readers. First and most obvious, men were much more likely than women to be able to write because reading and writing were taught as separate skills at school in the 18th and into the 19th century. So unlike today when kids are learning to read and they're holding crayons and writing their letters as they're learning the letters and learning to write them, in this period they were taught as completely different skills. So kids would learn to read from a horn book and then later on in their education they might be taught to write. So it's the case that girls might learn reading and needlework at school while boys might learn reading and writing. So young women, women might have been reading the book, but they might not have been able to write down anything about it. Second, as you've noticed, when young men read the book, it's transgressive. They're not supposed to be reading it. Jonathan Edwards gets upset, not because the book is what he calls a bad book, exactly, but because this kind of knowledge about childbearing is meant for women. In fact, in Northampton, the book is referred to, it's not called by name, you have to figure that out. It's actually called a granny book. Now, it's a book that's supposed to be specifically for women. So teenage boys aren't supposed to be reading it, and they're certainly not supposed to be teasing the girls with it. John Cannon's mother was incensed that he was reading her copy of the masterpiece. Again, it's a perfectly acceptable book for her to have and her to read. She's a mother but it's not okay for her teenage son to borrow it. So I've come to realize I need to find evidence of women's readership in less direct ways. That women did read the book, but I'm unlikely to find the kind of juicy tales I've just told you about actual women readers. First, there are a few stories about women reading the book, recorded by men, often in a somewhat derogatory way. For example, the English radical Richard Carlyle tells us that in 1812, he's a young artisan at this point, he was looking at a bookstall on Plymouth Dock Market when a well-dressed servant girl came up to the bookseller. She asked if the book her mistress had requested had come in, and he replied, yes, my dear, and handed her a copy of Aristotle's masterpiece. Carlyle describes disapprovingly that the girl looked as if she'd won a prize before she scampered away with the book to her mistress. Carlyle was scathing about the book itself, saying that it didn't contain a single word by Aristotle. True, point to Carlyle, I agree with you, no words by Aristotle. That the book was printed in the thousands in seaport towns for the sailors, as well as being on every London bookstall. Now, I have not seen any other references to this being a book for sailors and being for sale in port towns. I would love to find some confirming evidence for this because it, who knows, right? I, while away the long hours at sea, I don't know. But it's really interesting to me. Um, now, Carlyle is writing from a particular agenda. He is one of the first advocates for contraception in England. And part of his shtick here is that the masterpiece is useless junk. People shouldn't be reading it. And if it wasn't sold, he claims, if it wasn't sold sort of secretively, like under the counter, people would recognize it for the schlock that it was and it would immediately go out of print. I have to say here, Carlyle is a really bad prophet because it keeps on being published for another 100 plus years. But, um, he, I mean, he is sort of writing from a particular position. I don't consider this portrayal of the servant girl to be, you know, unmediated truth. But it is really interesting evidence that he considers it so widespread that you can find it on any London bookstall, you can find it in the port towns, etc. But not every female reader of the masterpiece was a servant girl scampering home with it to her mistress. Here's the last page of an edition of the masterpiece in a copy at the American Antiquarian Society. And I have to tell you, I haven't fully, fully decoded the handwriting yet. Here a man, or maybe a woman, has treated the book as if it's a little family history, writing, this book descended from my grandmother Sudworth, then to my mother, then to Sister Orpa, then to Sister Nancy Donnell, and then to Nancy McLean. Then he or she writes himself into this female family history, March the 1st, 1880, P. Thompson. 
I love the kind of idea that this is a book about making families. It's a book about reproduction, which this particular reader has transformed into this tiny little family history. And this is happening in a time and place where family history is itself becoming a genre. It is these New England old families, the kind of Nathaniel Hawthorns of the world, who really cared about this kind of ancestry, who wrote these kinds of family histories. But here it is embedded within the text itself, clearly an all woman's book, going from grandmother to mother to sister, etc. Sometimes women wrote their own names in the book, Here's a copy that's held at the library company in Philadelphia. I'm pretty sure this Louisa Champion, I've tried to track her down through the census records. I'm pretty sure that she's actually English by origin. She marries an English blacksmith and they emigrate to Iowa. And at the time, 1882, she already had four children. I have to say, if she thought she was going to find advice about contraception in the book, having four children already, I'm afraid that was not actually contained in the book. Unlike some other books of the period, it does not tell you about contraception, even in a like hinting or backhanded kind of way. But I'm pretty sure that's who that is. Or there's this one, which is actually in the collection at Hopkins. Um, and you see it's inscribed A.D. Law, 56 Foxbury Road, Broccoli. And I can trace her in the census records. She's born Alphonsine Desiree Mahier in Rouen, France, around 1858. In 1878, she marries Thomas Law, a Thames waterman, a classic London working class occupation, running a barge, intermittent and probably poorly paid labor. They move to this address. It's just south of Deptford, south of the, the river, sometime between 1891 when she was 33 and 1901 when she was 43. In neither of those censuses is she listed as having any children. So we may imagine she might have wanted a book on reproduction. Maternity was extremely highly valued in London working class communities at that time. So the book may have had that kind of appeal for her. We don't know. She still had no children listed in the 1911 census either when she was 53. Now, you can perfectly well say to me, hey, those are just a few female readers, just a handful. And I would agree. But my goal here is to use these very unusual moments when a reader writes in the book or a rakish young man walks into a fictional bookstore to develop a sense of the range of ways that people interacted with this book. In other words, all I can provide is a kind of scattergram with little dots of individual readers and individual moments of reading this book. I do have a lot more stories about readers than the ones I've told you here, but I'm just going to give you an overview of what I think the scattergram is going to look like before I move on to talk about some of the contents of the book. I think that one of the reasons for the book's extraordinary success is the way that it spoke to both men and women, offering men glimpses of sexual knowledge and women that knowledge plus a practical guide to pregnancy and childbirth as well as in sort of the editions from the 1702 on, it includes a set of remedies for common household ailments. I love it, the remedies are supposedly Hippocrates' own remedies. I mean, you don't get any better than that. Um, but it's a kind of handy, it has a little bit on physiognomy, it has a little bit, it has the, the zodiac man that shows you what times it's okay to bleed and not bleed. I think it becomes, it's sure it's a book about sex and babies, but it becomes a kind of portmanteau volume with these just few pages at the end that give you kind of household stuff you might want to know. And in later 18th century and early 19th century editions, sometimes there's a couple pages on venereal disease as well. So very common, very dangerous disease. So it acquires this kind of, um, for women, a kind of useful function. It's got care of the infant, it's got pregnancy. It's not a full domestic medicine manual by any means, but it has a bunch of things. If you're going to have one book, it has a bunch of different things that could be appealing for you. So I think it was a book that was read in multiple ways by multiple audiences. And yes, obviously the fact that it was about sex makes it of eternal interest, and that's part of the reason for its success as well. Now I want to talk about one of the themes to do with the actual contents of the book. Most of the masterpiece is similar to the midwifery manuals from which it is largely composed. By the time we get to the third version, it plagiarizes a whole bunch of other midwifery manuals. It's a real kind of, kind of text made up of patches of other texts. 
Most of it's pretty typical, but I want to argue there's a distinctive theme to the information and reproduction contained in the book, and that is the problem of resemblance. The core of the book is about why children both do and do not resemble their parents. This issue is highlighted right at the front of the book. Here's the frontispiece to the very first edition. So who are these people? Um, these two are not what they might appear to be. They are not mother and child. They are not the child of black parents. These two are examples of the theory of maternal imagination, very widespread in the Renaissance. So the theory of maternal imagination has it that when a woman is pregnant, something that she sees or imagines can be impressed upon the extremely plastic form of the fetus she's carrying. So women were told, for example, not to go to executions because horrible sights like that might deform the baby that they were carrying. Very, very common widespread belief. So these two, the black baby story is told all over the Renaissance, all over Europe. Um, that baby was born to two white parents. The white parents were having sex. At the moment of conception, the wife's eyes stray to a painting of a black man on the wall of the marital bedroom. And that image, at that moment, is, goes right through her eyes, as it were, through her brain and right to the womb, and impresses the form of the baby as black. It's interesting because the story is also told the other way, of two black parents and a white baby. And there's a wonderful version of the story where a princess has a baby of the wrong color and is accused of adultery and is going to get, accused, get executed when Hippocrates himself comes to her rescue and explains there's actually a natural explanation for why she has a baby of the wrong color. So this is a story that circulates very widely in the Renaissance. The hairy woman is the result, was born to a woman who prayed to a little picture, a little icon of St. James the Baptist while she was pregnant. This was James the Baptist in his desert father years. He was, the picture supposedly had him clad in a camel skin out in the desert. And her frail and perfect female mind transformed a saint in fur into a furry person. So this hairy baby was born to this woman who was praying to this little image of a saint. I need hardly add that in England, this is like an added frisson of horribleness because she shouldn't have been praying to images of saints anyway, right? So I think it reads even worse in a Protestant country. Um, she shouldn't have been doing that. So the two of them each have their own stories about the maternal imagination and then a woodblock engraver in the late 16th century puts them in the same frame. They're not really connected, right? Their stories are different, but he engraves them in the same picture in a discussion of monstrosity and then they stay together for hundreds of years. This actual image is recut from a picture in the collected works of Amboise Paré, the English translation in 1626. It's almost a direct copy. And the other pictures of monster babies come from the same pages of that book. So I think it's a kind of print shop moment when somebody's assembling the book and they kind of say, oh yeah, we need some good monsters. And so they quickly flip the pages. They have Paré there for some unusual reason, or they have the wood blocks and they copy them and put them all in the text. It's very much a kind of circumstantial thing. Now, I think that the implications of the theory of maternal imagination were somewhat threatening to patriarchal society. First of all, it suggests that women's weak and idle imaginations could threaten their children. And second, more deeply, that women had the power to disrupt the paternal line, to interfere with the transfer of qualities from father to son. Worse even than that, the masterpiece actually advises women how to get away with adultery. They advise specifically that if you're having an affair, you're sleeping with your lover, you need to imagine your husband while you're having sex with the lover so that should you get pregnant, the baby will look like your husband, whom it's supposed to look like, not the lover. Now, you would think this kind of takes the sparkle out of an adulterous relationship, but that is what the text advise. So this image of the power of the maternal imagination becomes like a trademark for this particular book for at least 150 years. Um, we see her over and over again. That's from the 1720s. They start doing an image where she and the baby walk into the philosopher's study. That Renaissance magus on the right is actually supposed to be Aristotle himself. Here's 1748. This is a really um, crude edition. 
1776, she's lost her hair, but she still has the baby. Here's 1787, I think this may even be a Glasgow edition, I'm not sure. Um, by the 1790s, she's acquired some nice dress, but she's lost the baby. Um, then we have this like really <laughs> wonderful image by not perhaps the most skilled of artists. That thing that looks like a teddy bear 150 years before they had teddy bears, that's an owl in most pictures. It's supposed to indicate the wisdom of the philosopher, but here it looks just like a little teddy bear. And then this is the kind of classic mid-Victorian way that this image is conveyed. By now, she's some abstract something. She's knowledge, she's beauty, she's truth. I don't know what she's doing in those veils. Um, but that's the kind of long trajectory. But I think the fact that she is a virtual trademark for the book for a really long time makes the book's commitment to the theory of maternal imagination central to its identity. You see that picture at the front of the piece, you know you're getting the right thing, but it's also a commitment that that is the position the book takes. Now, the maternal imagination is one way that the transfer of qualities from parents to child gets disrupted. The book also obsesses about another way in which that transmission gets interrupted, and that's in the production, as I've already suggested, of the so-called monster babies, grossly deformed infants who do not resemble their parents. Now, obviously, every society struggles to grapple with the meaning of this extremely rare event. Um, how does this happen? The masterpiece provides a range of typical reasons for the period. It offers a series of monsters, but gives a variety of explanations. It has the God's warning explanation, which is that something terrible happened and God wants to warn the whole community. It's not the fault of the parents. One of the monsters in it, for example, was born the year after the Pope was killed in battle in Ravenna in the early 16th century. It's not good to kill the Pope in battle. Baby's born with a cross on its chest, usually deformed. Nothing to do with the parents, all about community warning. But then other monsters are born to parents who are having immoderate sex, a whole range of reasons. So the masterpiece offers readers a very broad interpretive spectrum to think about that. But they're always there. This is kind of a rogues gallery I put together. Um, of this is, These are images from 1702 through 1849 of a particular monster, a hairy child born in Arles in the south of France in 1579. Um, you can see they always ha they're, they're paying to get these wood blocks cut and cut again. These monsters are always there, and even when they can't quite fit them in, I love that, they turn it on its side <laughs> to squeeze it in where they haven't quite left enough room. In the early 1830s, the masterpiece gets a new frontispiece. Anybody know who those are? Exactly, Chang and Eng Bunker, the so-called Siamese twins, the conjoined twins. Um, this is about a year after they go on tour in America for the first time. So to me, this is like the 19th century equivalent of posting it to the web. It's really fast. I mean, this image is taken directly from a poster for their appearance in Boston. All the details, everything has been copied exactly by the wood engraver and put into the front of the book. Um, Chang and Eng Bunker don't stay as the frontispiece for very long, but they are, again, about the problem of why children don't resemble their parents. When things go wrong, what is going on? Um, and I think this, the book's kind of chameleon-like qualities where it can appropriate this new cultural form, this new thing, and put it right in there and sell a few more copies of the book. I think that's part of the book's success as well, that it's very good at appropriating stuff and, and putting it in there. Now, this obsession with monstrosity continues apace for decades, indeed centuries. In James Joyce's Ulysses, Leopold Bloom looks at a copy of the masterpiece on a Dublin bookstall and describes the masterpiece's chromolithographs as cataloging all kinds of monstrosity, from supernumerary digits to swine-headed babies. Now, in classic Joyce form, of course, it doesn't actually have the swine-headed baby in it, but it's that kind of monster. Um, a very long ago story of hideous monstrosity, and there are chromolithographs. There's often, they're not technically chromolithographs, they're actually hand-painted lithographs, because it's cheaper that way, um, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. Um, 
all the, this kind of pictures. And I love that he sees it on a book stall. I keep seeing this book reappear, as it were, over time on book stalls. But I want to argue that the meanings of resemblance and problems of resemblance change over time. While resemblance is a significant theme, what it means and what those monster babies mean change. Stefan Mueller Willy and Hans Jörg Reinberger have recently suggested that the concept of heredity created a new epistemic space in the early 19th century. From animal breeding to gardening to medicine, questions about how qualities were transferred both from parent to offspring and from environment to body moved from the purely practical to the good to think with. They argue that the very open-ended early modern category of generation was replaced by heredity. Heredity is a biological model that drew its inspiration from legal codes of inheritance of property. So just like a child inherits a specific sum of money or a plot of land or a house, that child inherits blue eyes or a long nose, or an ability to play the piano, or whatever else. Um, that this notion of specific discrete things that get transferred from parent to child, these historians argue, is an invention of the 19th century and is modeled very specifically on inheritance. It's modeled on the transmission of property. Now, I just want to say the concept of heredity in the 19th century is still very pluripotential compared to our own ideas about genetics. In a way, heredity was interesting and good to think with precisely because it was open-ended. I mean, we think we know what happens, right? So we obsess at a completely different level about genomics and our own individual fates. But in the 19th century, the mysteries of transmission, coupled with the profound social implications of those transfers, made the problem of resemblance compelling for much of the 19th century. So I want to take these historians' insights about the creation of heredity and push it a little further by suggesting that generation is what's encoded in the Aristotle texts. It continues to be in those texts. That doesn't change. And I want to argue that the Aristotle texts continue to have appeal well into the 19th century and even into the 20th, precisely because they offer a more open-ended model that's not heredity and it's not modeled on laws about the transmission of wealth that for people for whom the transmission of wealth might have been irrelevant, perhaps this more open-ended model had some appeal. If we look at the popular books about reproduction from the middle of the 19th century, what I think of as the competition to the masterpiece at that particular moment in time, we see a much tighter and more restrictive understanding of how children come to resemble their parents. The masterpiece, which was once completely sort of canonical, becomes the exception, becomes an alternative vision of how you think about the relationship between parents and children. For example, if you look at a book called The Marriage Bed from the 1850s, it explains very specifically that one parent gives the shape of the front of the face and the head, and the other gives the back of the head. And what comes with the front of the face and the front of the head is, yes, the powers of observation. And what comes from the back of the head is reasoning abilities. And I don't think it's rocket science to figure out which one the 19th century thought ought to come from the mother and which one ought to come from the father, right? The face should come from the mother and the reasoning stuff should come from the father. And it says, if the parts be feeble in the parents, then it will be in the child also. The book then moves without even taking a breath right into a discussion of animal breeding as a model for humans. This is a much more determinative and reductive way of thinking about this. Another book from 1839 says, a superior breed of human beings could be produced only by selections and exclusions similar to those so successfully employed in rearing our most valuable animals. Eugene Becklard's Physiological Mysteries and Revelations, 1842, many subsequent editions, goes even further. It specifically punctures the myth that the masterpiece perpetrates. Becklard says, imagination isn't true. The maternal imagination doesn't exist. So don't think that you can think about your husband while you're having sex with your lover, because you know what? It won't work. That's not how the body works. It's much more specific. The transmission of qualities works in this other way, which I'm really entertained to think that this belief was so widespread that it was actually worth Becklard's effort to specifically denounce it that tells me that this, was, this wasn't just a random passing thing in the masterpiece. It was more significant than that. 
Now, it's true that the model of the transmission of qualities from parent to child that the masterpiece offers its readers is quite double-edged. On the one hand, it certainly has its misogynist qualities, that women's idle brains can spin much mischief. You know, that don't let her be dreaming away about stuff. Um, it can cause a lot of trouble. But it also suggests that women are pretty powerful, that their minds cannot be ignored, and that any model that just goes father to son is going to be incomplete and inadequate. So as heredity came to be a significant model of the transmission of qualities from parent to child, the masterpiece, I think, became a kind of alternative text because it offered a very different way of thinking about that kind of transmission. Here, I think James Joyce got here first, as it were, because not only does Leopold Bloom peruse a copy of the masterpiece on a bookstall, it turns out Molly Bloom already has her own copy. <laughs> she refers to it as aristocrat's masterpiece. This is a wonderful Joycean slip of the tongue because, of course, it is aristocrats who are the most invested in the proper transmission of qualities from father to son, be that the ability to rule, a family resemblance, the right kind of nose, what have you. It is aristocrats who really care about that kind of thing. So I think that Joyce sort of got that in a way that um, it took me a lot longer to understand. And I also just want to remind us that the problem of resemblance does not go away with the advent of heredity, however powerful a model heredity was. All of the British Isles became obsessed with the problem of resemblance in the late 1860s and early 1870s with the case of the Tichborne Claimant. Um, as some of you, I'm sure, are aware, this is a story about the gentleman on the left, Roger Tichborne, who was the son of Gentry, who went mm -hmm. off to sea and was drowned in a shipwreck off of South America. His mother, heartbroken, advertised all over the world for any sign that he had actually somehow survived. And the gentleman on the right, a butcher from Australia, turned up to claim that he was, in fact, the long-lost Roger Tichborne. The case went, I know, it's hard not to laugh. I, I try not to because I just think about the poor mother who was so distraught that she thought that Arthur Orton on the right really was her long-lost son. And it's easy for us to laugh at them. But, and, and I mean, you can't help it. It's funny to look at these two together. But I just want to remind us that these people didn't have DNA testing. They didn't have blood typing. The only, their big technology was photography. So how could you know if people were family or not? How could you know except by looking? The power of resemblance was what proved family relations in a way that I think we don't even really think about in the same way, in the sort of scientific way. We think about it anecdotally in family life, but we don't think about it as proof, as a kind of absolute way of knowing. But then I just remind you how many Victorian novels turn upon the long lost heir who appears from nowhere. Is this person really the long lost cousin or not? This problem of resemblance was alive and well for Victorian culture. So I want to conclude my um, discussion of these themes with one final story. Um, having talked about both the readership and the contents in some ways. I want to talk about the way one family responded to this theme of family relationships. They did so by making the masterpiece their family's equivalent to the Bible. In 1832, one Edward Wyatt went to court in Tennessee to try to get a pension connected with his military service in the War of Independence. I don't fully understand the ins and outs of how you could get a pension, but he had to have his discharge papers from the army to get the pension, and he didn't have them. He'd lost them over time. But part of the dispute about whether he's entitled or not has to do with how old he is. And the court notes he has a record of his age in a book called Aristotle's Masterpiece, suggesting that this family recorded births and marriages in their copy of the Masterpiece, which Wyatt was able to produce in court. And I have actually seen one copy of the Masterpiece at the National Library of Medicine, which has births recorded in it with dates. So Wyatt's family wasn't the only one. Now, back in 1745, one of the young men in Jonathan Edwards' Northampton Parish had irreverently referred to the Masterpiece when he was teasing the girls. He referred to it as the Young Folks Bible, which really did annoy Jonathan Edwards. So he's using it jokingly 
But a few decades later, Edwards Wyatt's family was using the same text as a family Bible for real. It is just such paradoxes that made the masterpiece such a long-running success. Thank you.